Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar, Measuring for Success. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Ben Kia. Ben hits uh, GP Strategies, Australia and Southeast Asia business. Uh, he also spearheads modern learning transformation services. And, uh, and our leadership uh, development practice and effect. And with that, I'm going to let you take it over from there. The floor is yours. I'm on mute and my camera was off. Uh, hopefully you can all see me. Hello, everybody. Really, really nice to, uh, to speak to you all. I can see we got people flowing in. We might just give it another couple of minutes before we get started. Um, but what I'm going to do is help you guys get connected to Menti, uh, um, which we're going to be using today. So already see we've got over 45 people joining. Probably a few more will come in over the next few minutes. So the first thing I'd like to do is let's get you guys connected into Menti. So I'm just going to bring up the Menti slide while we're waiting for more people to join. So hopefully you have your instructions there. You can either scan the QR code and use your phone, or you can open up a browser window and enter in the code, or you can go to menti.com on your phone and type in the code. There's lots of ways to access. Once you're logged in, please uh, click the heart button so I can see that I've got a whole bunch of people who have connected to Menti successfully. Down the bottom of that instructions page, once you're connected, there'll be a little heart icon. You can see it on the screen right here. So let's make sure you're all connected into Menti. We'll give it a couple of minutes. I can see we've got folks coming in from Bangalore. Hi, Shashi. Hi, Scott. Hi, Haniza. Hi. Uh, who else we got? Yu Kuang Chan. CJ. I think I might, I think we've met. Um, so guys, yep, log in to Menti. Hopefully you can see it on your screen right now and click the little heart icon down the bottom so I know that you guys are in. So far, I've only got one heart, which means that not everyone's in. And the seats are filling up, so we'll just still give it another minute. Oh, okay. I think, I think it might be on the wrong, wrong page. Let me make sure it's on the right page. Okay, here we go. I can see it all coming up. I can see the hearts coming up. That's great. So we'll be using Menti throughout this session and we'll probably get started now. I can see you guys are logging in. Okay, that's great. All right, so let's get started guys. So my name is Ben Kia. I am a uh, learning solutions director for Asia Pacific. I look after our South, our Singapore, Australia, Malaysia operations. But what's relevant today is where I come in relation to this topic of measurement. And so the other role that I play for GP strategies and for our customers across the region is around learning experience design, learning transformation, uh, learning technology selection and adoption. You know, we're really strong in that area. And so all of these webinars, for those of you who have been in my prior webinars, you guys will know that uh, we really spend a lot of time trying to, I guess, educate the market, uh, educate everybody on the ins and outs of good design of smart technology choices. And we've been doing this since before COVID, but of course, COVID accelerated things and made it more ur urgent. So, and I've been doing this work, uh, I've been in the learning space uh, since basically 2000, the beginning of the millennium was when I first went into L&D as, as a uh, lead for L&D for a call center for retail environments in insurance in Australia. I spent eight years in China, 
uh, as a partner and, and, and facilitator and designer in a leadership and cross-culture development uh, company in China based in Shanghai. Um, and then I joined GP when GP acquired that business and I relocated to Singapore where we've been doing working with companies in Southeast Asia in similar areas, leadership development, learning transformation, experience design. And now I'm back in Australia in winter, so you can see my warm, my, uh, my warm jacket here. Um, and, and in Australia, we're doing the same type of work. So, so I like the fact that I'm coming from a leadership perspective because I think we can all agree that leadership development is traditionally one of the hardest streams or domains of learning to measure. Right, it's very hard to, to measure the ROI and learning impact. So, so I think if we can crack that nut, if we can do that well, then it makes all the other ones a lot easier. So that's the perspective I'm coming from. And so hopefully now you guys ha have uh, found menti.com. We're going to be using that throughout. I can see a bunch of people have already found it. Whenever I come to a poll or some sort of a, uh, a, a, a activity, you'll see the instructions come up again. So you'll still be able to connect a bit later on. So hopefully you're connected. Let's go to our first little interaction right now. And I would like us to now, there we go, sorry. Facing some issues. Okay, here we go. I'd like us to now tell me where you are in the world. Pin your location. Tell us where you are coming from somewhere in the world. I imagine a lot of us are in Asia. Just drop a little pin and we'll see it all come up. Okay, we've got a whole bunch of people. We've got people in India. We've got people in Australia. We've got people in Japan, it looks like. Uh, Shanghai, Korea, all around Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, maybe. We've got some people, Hong Kong, possibly, testing my geography. We've got someone over in North America or the Caribbean or the, I don't know, somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean over there. That's pretty cool. That's, that's a rarity for us in this time zone. And we've got someone all the way down somewhere near Antarctica who must be very cold right now. Um, so, so we'll be using this Menti. It looks like you've all found where it is and we'll continue on. So here we're to talk about a measurement. And the truth about measurement is that measurement is everywhere. We measure things all the time, whether it's at home, even at work or at play. Measurement is a critical part of what we're doing every single day. And so what I'd like us to do now is maybe ask you a bit of a question. Just tell me in the chat, hopefully you've all found the chat and make sure when you're using the chat, you're selecting reply to everyone. What is something that you've measured today? And if you can't think of something today, think of this week. Think about, there's so many things that we measure. Have a look and tell me. What is it that you have measured today? Let's have a look at what's going on in the chat. My weight, okay, yeah, weight. Room temperature, yes, we're measuring room temperature. Number of kilometers that you ran from Shashi. How much my daughter drinks. How much water my daughter drinks, yeah. Head count, exchange rate. Oh, you measured head count today, did you, Graham? Okay, exchange rate, coffee, beans, I'm assuming that means, yeah, my heart rate, stock prices working allocation from time. Yeah, look, we're measuring stuff all the time. And the interesting thing about measurement is some things are really easy to measure. All this stuff that you're measuring, we can measure it because what? What do we have that makes, help, makes it easy to measure things like weight or measure things like uh, how much coffee I've drank? What is it that makes that easy? Tell me in the chat. All of those things that you're measuring. We got metrics, we got tools, we got kilograms, we have scales. Yeah, we've got the tools for it, but we also have the definitions and the units of what we're measuring. Okay, Power BI brings together a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, so we got tools, you guys are mentioning tools, but also we can't get away from not just tools. It's because there is some data point, some standard of measurement, right? We know there's a thousand grams in a kilo. We know there's a thousand meters in a kilometer, right? We've got all of these different definitions and descriptors for measurement. But when we're measuring learning, truly measuring learning, it's sometimes a little bit more difficult, right? And I think what we found, yeah, I, I think Shashi said return on investment. Yeah, I'd love to measure return on investment, but what is the version of kilograms for return on investment for mentoring training? What is the version of kilograms and my scale for 
when I'm rolling out some sort of leadership training, you know, and, and then it's one thing to define it. It's a whole nother thing to actually measure it. Right. And so, so why is this important? Well, some of you have, have, have been to my previous webinars and you will know that one of the things that I focus on is the way that learning is transforming. Right? I've spoken a little bit about making sure that our learning is designed to meet people in the moments of learning need where traditional learning that we may have engaged in over the last 30 or 40 years has been more in these first two moments, right? The first moment is when it's new. I come to a classroom training, do this e-learning, right? But as we move into a world where we need to constantly upskill and reskill and where we don't have the resources as a company to, to support learning all the way through, to, to drive reskilling and upskilling, people need to be learning on their own. People need to be learning on the fly, right? And so what that means is, the learning, the way that we're designing learning, the frequency of it, the duration of it is changing. Learning is increasingly more continuous. Learning is increasingly more self-directed. It is micro, it is spaced over time. And so when we're measuring learning, if we're really going to make sure we're doing a good job, at least, at least in a classroom training, I had a beginning and an end, and I could put, give someone a, a nice little evaluation at the end. And I'd get a measurement on the trainer's performance and you know, I'd get be able to check the box and say, yes, you've completed this learning. At least I could measure those level one Kirkpatrick things pretty easily. But in a world of learning where things are transitioning, data becomes more relevant. How do I know if, a, if learning is effective continuously over time when learners are participating in it in their own time, at their own pace, not when I have scheduled it as an L&D practitioner or leader, Right. And so, so this is the world of learning we're moving into and kind of have to move into to meet our reskilling and upskilling efforts. But where does measurement sit within this? And, and measurement, our, our ability to, to measure things and to, to design to measure things has become even more important in this world. The other challenge I think that we're facing, again, this is a little bit of a, a, a refresher from a previous webinar, is the difference between how we measure today how we design today and how, how we need to do it in the future, right? And so currently, or traditional learning in organizations, corporate learning, has been kind of centered around top-down instructor-led, right? So we have this top-down training, we have instructor-led training, it's mandated, it's synchronous, meaning the, all the learning happens at the same time. And the way that we design for that is we do some needs analysis, we pick our content, we pick our modality, hopefully we get results and do we measure? I don't know. And so what we kind of had is this policy of someone requests learning, right? Some department in our company says we need to learn something and boom, we give them the learning and we measure it. And there's some magic that happens in the middle. This magic of of learning and we're somehow going to know that we're going to be successful, that ROI is going to be there and they're actually going to be able to measure it. But the truth is, if you design the way that I was just describing, if you put measurement as an afterthought or measurement at the end, then it's really not going to work, right? If we're going to really fill in this gap, this magic gap in the middle and turn it into something meaningful, we need to think a little bit differently. And in a world of self-directed learning, continuous learning, asynchronous learning, learning in the flow of work, look at the difference in flow. Look where measurement sits in this approach to learning. I don't start with content, first of all. I start with understanding the business. What are the business requirements? Not just what did the business ask me for. Hey, I had a request for for negotiation skills. I'm going to go out and find negotiation skills. No, I need to understand why does the business need it? What are the drivers behind it? Who are those learners? What do they need? Where are they? What's relevant to them? How much time do they have? And then the very next question I ask myself is, what am I going to measure? How am I going to know it's going to be successful? Right? Because those three things will inform what content you need. They will inform the right modality and they will help you get to the right results. And so measurement is really something that's going to be sitting earlier in our design phase. And that's really what we're here to talk about. That's our agenda for today. How do we design? How do we include measurement into our design so we can equip ourselves with the ability to measure later when it delivers or throughout as it delivers? So to get there, let's talk a bit about the current state of measurement. So I think you've all heard of the Kirkpatrick 
um, scale of measurement, right? We've got, well, I always say level zero is just when you're designing or developing the, the content, but level one is kind of engagement. What's the immediate reactions to people? Um, that would be like your happy sheets, uh, your level one evaluations. Level two is has there been some sort of a gain in learning? So this might be an assessment, some sort of test. Also, it typically happens in and around the, the learning. Behavior change is level three. Has there been a change of some sort on the job over a period of time, right? And then level four is business results and ROI, right? At level four and level five starts moving in that direction. So I've got a little poll for you guys. I'd like to understand from you, tell me, realistically, honestly, what... Sorry, my playing a little bit of havoc here today for me. Okay, realistic, what levels, I don't know, is it, is it, I don't know if it's going to the right thing here. Let me just see what's going on. Sorry, I apologize. I'm having a little bit of a, a menti freak out. Here we go. Nope. Okay, what levels of Kirkpatrick do you realistically measure? I'm really not sure why that is not coming up for you guys. It's blank on my screen. Let me try and see if I can fix something here. Okay, you guys see a five, see a five scale. Okay, good. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for letting me know. Let's hope that some of the results are coming through. I don't know why it's not coming out. Give me one sec, guys. I'm going to try to get this working for us. Okay. Hopefully now it's coming up now. Let's see if that's going to work for you guys. Okay. I think we should be good now. So now, guys, let's see if we can fill that in. Okay. We got some results coming up. Honestly, I don't. we don't really measure... We do measure all the way to level four, level four plus ROI business impact on the job. Level two learning gain, usually only level one. Keep it going. Let's see these results come in. I know we've got over 60 people online today. I think we can already see a trend, right? And I, I put the word realistically because I know like we, we want to measure up to level four and level five. And maybe we do it for some programs, but maybe we don't always do it for all programs. But I would say what you're putting is pretty accurate. I think definitely a lot of us measure level one, but it looks like the majority of us are kind of sitting around that level two learning gains phase, which includes assessment. It might include some sort of certification, um, but, but yeah, but where that sits in the moments of learning need, that's still in the first moments of learning need. Right? When I'm measuring learning gain, it's typically within a close proximity to when that learning event occurred. But it looks like we're, we're on the same page here. And the data um, from Leo, which is one of our, our development brands, they ran some research in 2019 on what learners, uh, learning needs and what we want to, how we measure business impact. And 96% and of respondents in that survey that we ran said, yes, we really want to measure learning impact. It is important to us. But that 10% of people really felt like they were actually measuring business impact. And I think that's pretty indicative of what we just saw in our little impromptu poll. And so why is that? Why do you think? Well, I'm going to give you another poll. Hopefully, it doesn't blow up in my face again this time. Let's just make sure it's all coming onto the right pages here. Okay. You should be good now. So this is a ranking activity. Why is it hard to measure? I want you to rank them, right? Is it too hard? We don't really know how. We can't really get the data. I've got other priorities, distractions. No one's really asking. My KPI targets don't really push me in that direction. Go ahead. Let's start doing some ranking. OK, 
Okay, I can see some results coming up. I'll just get them to refresh onto the screen here. I'm having a very clunky Mentimeter experience. Here we go. Okay, can't get the data coming in. Number one, we've got a few changes. Keep on going, guys. Keep on responding to 60 of you. I want to get as many results as we can. Now, it's interesting, actually, that this data that's coming through, you'll see, I'll show you a comparison from 2019, which is before COVID, um, how things have changed. Now, let's give it a little bit more time to give us your rankings. I think we can see a bit of a trend here. Number one is we just can't seem to get the data. Number two is we don't really know how. Number three is that it maybe feels like it's too hard. And number four is you know, other priorities. And what's interesting is I'll show you the 2019 data. So when we ran that same questions in 2019, it was a global survey. Number one was actually completing competing priorities. Number two was we don't know what to do, what to measure, how to measure. Number three was you can't get the data. Number four is no one was asking. I think we've seen a big shift over COVID, right? We're doing more virtual stuff. We're doing more digital stuff. There's a greater emphasis on measurement. More questions are being asked from within l d from stakeholders and from business leaders around these types of things so i'm not surprised to see these changes but look guys this is what we're here to address and what i want to give you guys is a bit of an antidote right how can we go from changing it to magic to actually having a process that puts this into work and the answer is well one of the answers and the answer that we use in our design process is measurement mapping so measurement mapping is something, a process created by Bonnie Beresford, who's one of our consultants over in the US. Um, and effectively, it achieves the following things. It defines the alignment between develop, uh, investments that you're making within L&D and business outcomes. It identifies what to measure in a way that shows impact. It gives the impact of measurement on design. So you'll see how measurement impacts your design in a fundamental way. Rather than being an afterthought, it's going to be an integral part. And we're also going to later on explore a real case for it. And so what we're talking about here is, yes, you've got your Kirkpatrick scales. You're still welcome to use that. It's still a good model. But what we want to do is give you the kilograms, the tools, the, the metrics, right? We can measure our weight because we know what we're measuring. We have this tool to do that, right? That's what we need to create. And we've got to define what our version of kilograms is or kilometers or whatever that may be up front. And we need to think about the tools that we're going to use to measure it in the design phase. So the key to measuring, just if I ended the webinar right now, is to build it into your design. So how are we going to do that? Well, we have that upfront investment and we know we had the kind of strategic outcomes we hoped were going to happen. And in the middle here, what we need to do is we need to figure out what are the leading indicators that are then flowing into the business results that are then flowing into the strategic goals. Effectively, what we need to ask ourselves is what is the evidence that this type of learning is working? And then once we know what type of evidence we can be looking for, we then need to define, it'll then enable us, sorry, to define succession measurable terms. So to use a really good metaphor of what I mean by leading indicators and business results, imagine you're selling a house. Right? Or maybe imagine you're a real estate agent and you're selling a property. The leading indicators would be all of the signs that, uh, that you're on your way to selling the home. So maybe you can tell me, like, tell me in the chat, what might be some signs if you're a real estate agent that, hey, you know what? I think we're on our way to selling this house. Tell me in the chat, what could be some, some of those leading indicators? Selling a house, selling an apartment, selling a car if you don't, if you're not comfortable selling us. Okay, number of inquiries, attendance at the open house. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. Yeah, like how many have we got the listings out there, the quality of the listing? Um, yeah, number of conversations that are happening about the property, how many follow-ups are occurring, how many web hits we're getting. Yeah, you you guys have got it. Number of contracts that people have asked for, um, number of contracts that have been submitted. Yeah, absolutely offers that are coming in. And so, yeah, you guys have really got it. Basically, what we're looking at for is the business results carry a measurable result and leading indicators are evidence that we're moving in the right direction towards that measurable result. All right, so number of virtual tours to use Adrian's one, right? If I can track that and I know that that's an important indicator, will then maybe lead to if I, I know if I have a number of virtual tours, I know if I've got a certain number of web hits, I know if I, if I um, you know, have a certain number of inquiries, number of open house attendance, 
then that might lead to a business measurable result. A measurable result might be um, A, that it's sold, but B, that I've had a number of contracts. I know if I get this many inquiries, then I'm going to get this many asks for a contract. And if I get this many asks for a contract, then I'm going to get you know, this much percentage chance of the, of the ultimate goal, which is selling the home, right? And so that's really the difference here. But it's one thing to talk about real estate. What does this talk about in business? Well, let's kind of start talking about an environment we're all familiar with, which is in a restaurant. So suppose that you own a, a restaurant, right? And you want to run some front of house training. So these are your waiters, you know, people who are basically your customer service people. And we want to run some soft skills training. What would be some soft skills that you might teach these people for your front of house training? What are some soft skills you might want to give to people? Think communication, whatever you want, put it in. What are some training skills that you might look at? Go ahead, tell me in the chat. Okay, yeah, managing difficult customers, handling difficult customers. Yeah, you're grooming what you look like, problem solving, complaint handling, rapport building, time management, yeah. Um, or I'd call that like kind of space management, right? Um, for, for a waiter, um, listening skills, custom handling, prioritizing, cross-selling, exactly what I was expecting for us to order right. So let's keep that in our mind. Thank you guys for sharing. Let's keep these in your mind. Bank that for a second. Now, what we're going to do is because what we just did then was our old version of design where we kind of, we know we have a need and we go and we find content, right? Okay, I need to train front of house. I'm going to find content. I'm going to find communication skills, complaint handling skills, you know, presentation by the presentation. I mean, you know, the way that you dress and whatnot. So I know I'm going to do that. That's the old way of thinking, but we're not going to do that. We're going to backtrack here for this restaurant and we're going to do a measurement map together. But before we actually kind of go all the way through it, I want us to look at the quality of what we're putting into our measurement map. So let's start with leading indicators. Which of these, we've got to make sure we've got good leading indicators, right? Which, if we know we need a profitable restaurant, right? Some leading indicators that we might be heading in that direction could be number of desserts ordered, number of incorrect orders. I don't know, we've got number of parking spots in here, number of bottles of wine. Which of these would not be a good leading indicator for front of house training moving towards a profitable restaurant? Which of these would not be a good leading indicator? Tell me in the chat. Yeah, Sabrina's first in. Yeah, parking spots. Now, of course, I'm being kind of overly obvious here, but what I'm trying to get out of here is you need to really think carefully about your leading indicators to make sure that they truly are factors that are going to lead you to your goals, right? So, okay. So, if you're right. It is parking spots. But now, here we've got another one here. Business results. We want to see the average table spend go up. We want to see a, a, a certain reduction in the dollars in wasted food, um, advertising costs. Uh, which of these is not necessarily a good KPI, front of house training, and a profitable restaurant for business results? Advertising costs, not really relevant. It's not really something we should be tracking. You're right. So we're going to cross that out. So what we've ended up here is I've put in some, some examples, right? We do want to get a number of desserts ordered because we know when people order desserts, it adds profit to that to that seating. We know that um, reducing incorrect orders saves us money because it will um, it will ensure that we are not wasting money. Um, number of positive reviews, perhaps, right? We want to make sure we get positive reviews because that will co correlate to things. And we know that alcohol is always a great way to drive extra revenues with every seating at the table. So if we map this out, we kind of map this kind of this flow, right? We've got some front of house training and that front of house training needs to achieve these things. And if it's going to achieve these things, then it's going to achieve these business results. And if it achieves these business results, we know it's going to be profitable. But now think back. Think back to those skills or those elements of training that you told me about earlier. How would you revise those now with these leading indicators? You had cross-selling, prior uh, communication, Customer, uh, customer handling, time management, rapport building, problem solving, grooming, handling difficult situations. How would you evolve these now to better design that front of house training, knowing that what your indicators are of success, of business success? Tell me, what would you put in there? In the chat.
would it change? I think people are still kind of pondering. Yeah, I might do a great emphasis on teaching on the menu. Um, I might, yeah, have dedicated training on how to increase table spend. Um, yeah, upselling, I think, starts to emerge as a priority here. I might have, when I do communication skills, now I want to focus on confirming and checking, right? How are you recording the order and how are you confirming and checking understanding? I might, I might still have customer service training, but I want to use those as my scenarios and my case studies, right? I, yes, I might have training on social media and, and, and skills around how do I get people to fill out reviews and be positive about the reviews, right? So this is what I'm trying to get at here. M measurement mapping, eventually, what we're going to get to is that we're going to be able to measure it. Um, what well, reduced waste by training on the actual food? Yes. Yeah, so training on how to make sure you've got the order correct and that you're communicating about the, mean, the, the menu correctly and that you're asking questions around diet requirements. Um, so yeah, and, and so Adrian's mentioned something. Yeah, you might want to unpack and draw the correlation in the training. This is maybe business acumen, right? Around the correlation of these indicators to the results, to the strategic goals. So what measurement mapping does for us, before we even get to the actual measurement, when we spend time, taking time to start with the end in mind, work back and say, okay, what are the business results that tell us we're, we're, we're going to move towards our strategic goals? And what are the leading indicators that tell us we're moving towards the business results? It enables us to validate our content. It enables us to be ruthlessly relevant to the business and what the business needs. So coming back to that example of that, when you get one of your business um, stakeholders ringing up your business, HR business partner and saying, I need negotiation skills training. Well, hold on a second. Even if it's just a vanilla classroom training, what are we trying to achieve here? What are the goals? How do we know it's successful? What are the first signs that this negotiation skills or whatever, this learning would be successful, right? Then I can be very critical and I have some authority and power to affect content. So my, so from the start, I can be confident that my choice of content, my beginnings of investment in learning are starting at the right place. That's kind of lesson one. And the other thing you'll notice here is, like, what do you notice about each of these items? Number of desserts, number of incorrect orders, average table spend. What do you notice about all of these uh, bullet points here? Yeah, you've got it, Adrian, you're on it. You're earning extra points. Yeah, they're all qualitative and they're quantitative, right? They're both. So, um, sorry, I've got the wrong word in there, but, but they are quantitative. I don't know why qualitative is in there. We can measure them, right? And so this is how we build out our measurement maps, right? And if I just use uh, swimming as an example, right? Michael Phelps or some other famous swimmer. The end in mind is that I want to be go to the Olympics and I win a gold medal, right? But I don't just go, okay, let's start training. Even in this situation, I've got to work backwards. Well, I know that if I'm going to win a gold medal and qualify for the Olympics, I need to do my freestyle 200 meters under this time, my butterfly under this time. I know they're the results that I need to achieve. The indicators I'm going to get there is how many breaths I might take in a lap or how many strokes. What's my working heart rate? What's my body fat percentage? What's my da-da-da-da-da? And from here, I build my training regime. And so that's really what we want to get into is we want to make sure that we're able to achieve that in the corporate learning environment. So let's do a couple of examples together. I'm gonna jump into an example around car dealerships. I think some, many of us have bought a car. We all understand what it is to own a car. Or even if you haven't, you know, there's some awareness of cars. It's a common thing we can rally around. Um, we also do a lot of work in the automotive space, but let's say I wanna invest in some soft skills. I wanna develop some training we know the problem that we're faced now is there's a gap between the investment that we make and the ability to measure those goals. There's kind of this hope that there's a miracle. We're going to change that. You know, we often use design thinking. And so it's really in the define phase that this would occur when I'm defining the parameters of the design. And we know now from the previous, act, previous example that one thing defining measurement early can do is help us validate the learning content and the outcomes. But it also helps define the modality of learning and the choices that learners make and the type of culture that I want to create from a learning perspective. So let's bring all of this down to the car dealership. So we want to train sales staff in a car dealership on how to sell cars. 
right? They might be new staff. What are we going to do? So tell me in the chat, what are some things that you might train if you wanted to train sales staff in a car dealership? And I think we might have some automotive people on here. So I'm expecting some high quality responses. Tell me in the chat, what might you include in this training T traditionally? Yeah, definitely you need product training. We need to understand the sales process. Yeah, product knowledge I think is really central because if you don't know the product, then you can't speak intelligently. Yeah, sales pitches, how to, how to give a lot, of, a lot of focus on sales skills. Social media presence has come up. That's great. Yeah, I like that Ali's asking the right questions. Yeah, but how do we know what content it was actually a bit of a trick question, right? How do we know what content they need? Our gut tells us, our experience tells us they need some of these things. But what we want to do is go through a sales train, a sales process. So what we'd actually lead off with, we know we want to be more profitable business. We want to sell more cars. We want to have a higher market share with the brands that we're selling. Okay, the business results that, we, uh, we, that we're going to use to measure this is total sales volume, gross profit on vehicles sold. Um, other business results is new customer sales volume, gross profit per sale, repeat and referral sales volume, um, gross profit per sale uh, for repeat sales. So these might be some business results. And then some leading indicators might be closing ratio, number of referred customers, number of repeat customers, number of customer contacts, number and percentage of appointments. So number of people that have reached us and numbers that actually take place, number and percentage of test drives, vehicle walkarounds, social media reviews, customer satisfaction index. So if we know that this is going on, if, we, if we've identified these are our leading indicators, now we can start to pick apart those ideas that you guys had for sales training and start to make sure that this training is ruthlessly relevant to your learners in your business. So yes, I still wanna have sales training. I still wanna talk about how to close, but I know that if I'm gonna close, a leading indicator of closing is that they've done a vehicle walk around. And I know that if they're going to do a successful vehicle walk around, they need to have great product training. I know that they're going to need to be able to engage in some sort of test drives. Maybe it's changed with COVID, right? And now there's a, a digital layer of competence that's required. Um, and so basically, I can design my training. If I've built a sales training and it doesn't include a process on how to do a really successful vehicle walk around or I haven't given guidance, yeah, thank you, around I haven't given training on how do you tactfully ask for a referral right? Then I know that I'm not necessarily training the things, even if it's the same topic, but I'm not presenting it and framing it in a way that's going to be connecting to things that I want to measure. And so that's how I've designed that training. And I've, I feel like I've designed it in a way that maps towards my leading indicators. Now we can actually start measuring it. I've rolled out the training. As long as my, my dealer management system, or I've got a system that's somehow tracking these things, because remember, they've got to be quantifiable. I can now straight away after that training rolls out over the next month, I can start to track, have these numbers gone up or down? And if it hasn't gone up or down, I can go back and adapt and adjust my training. So maybe I run a pilot group, just one dealership goes through that training. I've carefully designed it. I've got high confidence in it because I know I've factored in measurement in advance, but I still need to hold that learning accountable. So that's the, the, the next step of measurement mapping. Step one is validating your content. Step two is immediate rapid validation of if the learning is the right investment. So I've built this learning, but I want to be able to adapt and adjust that learning quickly to make sure that I'm actually leading to the results that I want. So maybe I need to tweak some components of this learning with my next rollout, my next pilot delivery. And then when I've got things moving, I can roll it out en masse, right? So it's about confirming that this learning is working. The third stage of measurement mapping is I guess the overall results, right? And so once I'm confident that I've designed the right learning, that that learning is actually working because I've piloted it and I'm actually checking those leading indicators immediately, I'm, I'm monitoring it because I know those leading indicators are gonna lead to those business results. Those business results are gonna lead to those strategic goals. I now can roll that out and I can observe the chain of evidence take place. And when my manager says to me, hey, what was the impact of that sales training? I know because I've designed to meet specific indicators and I'm confident those indicators are going to lead to those business results, I can actually present a causal chain of evidence for why this training is working and why it's not. What is the ROI of this learning? Whereas if I flip this around and I just rolled out a generic sales training, 
and I didn't even stop to think about how I'm going to measure it, then you're not really giving yourself any favors or your leadership team any favors around ROI and measurement, right? You're making it harder for yourself. Um, so, so, and so this is kind of the art of, of measurement. So let's see, we've got a question coming in. How do we exclude the market force from our measurement? Example, we delivered a very good training, but market is declining due to global national factors. Okay. Look, Richard, that's a, that's a massive question, right? So I know that in Australia, we do a lot of work in the automotive space and there are other factors that might be, the training might be good, but people aren't participating in it or there might be other priorities. Is that what we're talking about? Other factors that might influence the impact of learning? Is that what you're talking about, Richard? Apart from just the quality of the learning. Just confirm for me. Yeah. Well, look, some of these elements are, are, are come back to design. And I did a, a webinar. My last webinar was around learning experience design. I would say several things. Let me just jump back a little bit here. When we're going, when, when GP moves through design thinking, when we are actually building this out, you know, in the empathize phase, we are actually capturing industry company market issues that might be of influence in the empathize phase because we're not just empathizing with the learners right and from the learners we get their resistance their current skill level where where are they you know when i work with a dealership network in australia for example for cars um there are some in rural australia and the, the metro dealerships and the rural dealerships are completely different there might even be negativity right like when holden and ford got out of australia there was all sorts of problems right so in the empathize phase you're pulling in those factors and we're kind of moving away from measurement here, but into good design. And when I'm defining it, I'm actually defining strategies that I can build into my learning that help to overcome those other environmental factors. I can't cover them all, but a good example is we actually established that when we were going through the design for a, a, an after sales process training, that there would be resistance, especially in certain states, certain areas. And so we actually designed a kickoff Right, that actually had nothing, well, it wasn't content related. It was purely designed to win people over and overcome some of those objections. Or we built out a marketing and communication strategy that, that was to go along with the training to help when that launch happened, that it was done in a way that, that tried to nip those things in the bud that we had established. Are there going to be variables we hadn't prepared for? Maybe, but this is really where your question comes in. It's it's not so much the measurement side. It's have I understood the factors that are driving my people and my business? And have I considered change management and adoption into the launch of this training? So that includes marketing and communications. It includes the order in which I launch it. It includes what I, what's the first interaction people have. It might even include what I start with. So I'll give you an ex another example. We're working with a German luxury performance brand across Asia Pacific. And their question, they want to launch a whole new learning academy, new technology, new everything, right? And so the question for that is, if you launch that without thinking about the resistance factors, the industry factors, it might just fall on its face. And so what we've actually done is we've actually carefully selected what is the first topic across all the domains of learning within that, autumn, that brand's training, what's the first topic that is most likely to, for people to want to rally around? And for that one, we picked product training. Originally, it was going to be leadership training, but hey, that's not going to reach enough people, you know, but product training is actually going to be the one that everyone cares about. There's less resistance around learning about the product because people are passionate about the brand, you know, and so product training was the gateway into this learning transformation. So I hope I've kind of answered the question. It's not so much measurement related, but it does come into these early design phases. Um, so Richard, we can also connect later, mate, and, and talk about it uh, in more detail another time. So to move back to that car dealership example, and I'm going to be wrapping up soon to, to give time for questions. Uh, let me just jump ahead to that. When we have this dealership training, so we know that we've mapped it out, we've designed our learning to help make sure we are building towards the not just the end result, but the leading indicators. So I can quickly see, if I've taught people on how to do test drives, I should see an increase or in the quality and the frequency of test drives. If I've taught people X, Y, Z, I want to see that in leading indicator. So we've done all of that. Now we can actually start to go and measure it, but there's more to it than just the performance. Some of you would already be interacting with this, but another factor here is technology. 
we are getting flooded with more and more and more technologies. And increasingly, the ways that we're launching training um, is changing, right? It's no longer just not always just be in a classroom at this time or attend this virtual session. Learning is evolving and changing. And another big factor that organizations are, are striving for that we work with is changing their learning culture. So how can I roll out that sales training for that dealership, but at the same time, use it as a catalyst to create learning behaviors that I know our business needs, right? So my, our learning behaviors today are people wait to be told what to learn and when to learn. There's resistance from leadership about getting people off the job. Um, people need to be dragged through the learning when the learning happens. I don't know what I'm giving you the worst case scenario. So when I go out and I establish that's our learning culture today, but due to an increasing requirement to constantly stay up to date on products or an increasing requirement to upskill and reskill because of changes in automation in our workforce, right? Whatever our, our goals are, we no longer want a workforce that is waiting to be told what to learn. We want a workforce that chooses to learn. We want a workforce that learns continuously. We want a workforce that is engaged in their own learning. Maybe our business thrives off social learning. We want to promote learning where people connect and collaborate and users generate their learning. So the other thing we can do with measurement mapping is build for that type of activity. So here we've got some strategic goals. Now I've piv pivoted it from business goals to strategic learning goals. On top of training sales training, I also need our business to move in a way where it's an adaptive self-directed learning culture. Um, our brand benefits from peer-to-peer -peer learning. So I wanna have communities of practice. That's gonna help our business long-term. I need people to get comfortable with being social. I need people to get comfortable with recording a video and sharing it. I need people to get comfortable participating in discussion forums and sharing best practices. And we also know that we have a strategic goal around employee retention. So you can actually use the measurement mapping to actually map out the same. Hi, sorry everyone. I think Ben got disconnected for a bit. Um, let me just check and see if we can get him back uh into the session. Yeah, just give us a couple of minutes. Yeah, I think here we go. I think Ben is back. Hey Ben. Oh, hi all. Yeah, I apologize. I just got kicked off. I'm living in a what appears to be uh, very bad internet in Australia. So I apologize I got kicked off. But look, we're almost at the end, guys. What I was trying to get across is that if can you guys hear me okay, Mavis? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I apologize. I, I'm not going to be able to show that final slide, but what I was trying to get across is if you also know where you need to go from a learning culture standpoint, from a values and behavior standpoint, you can also build out indicators that are moving you in that direction. And that informs not just the content, but the method of design but not just a method of design, maybe the right technology that you guys need. Um, what technology do we need? If we know that peer-to-peer -peer learning is critical, well, I'm going to go out and find learning technology that supports peer-to-peer -peer learning. If I know that user-generated content and I want to have that happen then and video is important, then I'm going to make sure I get that because that's the culture that we need that, that matches to what where we are today and where we want to go. So, so to summarize, and before we move into just Q&A, um, measurement mapping is a great process for doing three things. Number one, if we build out our measurement maps in the design phase, it'll help us validate, kind of temperature check, 
the content or the, 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 the approach that we're trying to design. So before we even launch it, we're already measuring it. Number two, measurement, because we've mapped that content appropriately and we've mapped it to leading indicators, we've built our measurement map, it actually makes it more feasible to actually measure the impact of the learning. When someone asks, how's it going? What's the ROI? Well, I've mapped this learning to metrics. I know we can actually measure and I've mapped it to, to, to do that. And number three, I can actually use measurement mapping to help drive other behaviors beyond just the learning outcomes by considering them in the design phase. So that's measurement mapping. And this is the strategy that I wanted to put forward for you guys to be able to take with you to use as you embark on improving your measurement plans for your business. But I'm gonna pause here for questions. I'm also gonna to try to figure out how I can get back online. Hopefully I'll be able to get back on quickly. So, but for now, um, I can't see the chat, Mavis. So we'll just have to um, mention the different questions that are coming up. Sure. I think there was a question asking around um, sharing this slide deck. Uh, just for information, the recording of this session will be shared after this. So do look out for that um, next week. And I apologize about getting booted off the internet. I uh, Hopefully we can still do a decent Q&A without the slides. Any further questions for Ben? Okay, we have a a note from Sashi. Uh, ben, he will message you later. Okay, sounds great. I actually had a case study to share a mentoring program we ran and all the implications of design. I might record a special session to show it to you guys because it shows the full measurement mapping process, where there were problems with the measurement mapping and the results that we tracked and measured because um, we got to run an A-B test with and without um, this mentor training and without the with, with the mentor training, without the mentor training. So I'll be able to show you the, the actual impact of something complex like building a mentor culture and developing mentorship skills. Um, so I might record a special 10 minute one or five minute one and post that on LinkedIn, given that I'm gonna have struggle to show it to you now. There's a question from Sabrina. Do you have any mm -hmm. advice for how this can be applied to any external audience um, where you don't have the same level of data? Well, uh, I think what is the learning? I, my first question is, what are you trying to teach this external audience? And does external audience mean that you work for a company that's providing learning to customers? Could you maybe give a bit more clarity what it is you're asking for? Yeah, same question from Haniza as well. Yeah, yeah, I just need to understand by external what exactly are we referring to? It's uh, delivering learning to an audience uh, outside of the business. Look, the same thing applies. So right now we work with a large tech company that I shall that shall remain nameless, but one that you've all heard of and probably interact with on a daily basis. And they, we did, we'd help develop a learning academy for training users of cloud certain cloud software and, and, and tools and features and it is absolutely possible to use measurement mapping because why am i running even though it's for external people you know why am i doing this well when we did the measurement mapping obviously the results are we want to increase re uh, you know ups ups upsell and, and cross sell of different services within the cloud platform we want to increase utilization because the number one factor for that organization um, of, of drop-in revenue was when people bought something but then failed to use it beyond the first three months, failed to basically get value from their investments. Um, you know, so we mapped out all of these factors that they needed um, and then we we're actually able to map that back to the learning. So, okay, if we know that decreasing the time to ROI is critical and that we know that having them introduced to other experiences, other, sorry, other technology options within the cloud suite are our priority. Like there are business results. We're able to map that back and make sure that we're designing that learning 
to meet those business outcomes. It was actually less relevant that they were external. There were still definite reasons why they're investing in that training. And then we're able to then measure, is this working? So of course, we still had the standard measurements like amount of participation. We still developed to make it engaging. We put a layer of gamification in. We made it microtized. We did things for the learners. Here, I'm talking about measurement specifically. And so, yeah, absolutely, you can do that. It still comes down to why are you training those external customers and mapping back to the leading indicators that that investment is moving in the right direction. I think it's the exact same thing. Another question from Adrian. How do you ensure you have included all the input costs, not just the cost of the training, in order to calculate a meaningful and accurate estimate of ROI? Yeah, so that's a, that's a difficult one, right? Because there's a lot of indirect costs that go into learning. So of course you have, um, look, it's just, that's really rigor, right? And, and depending on what type of data such a business has access to, but, you know, maybe coming up, what we do is we come up with a blueprint that at least covers the broad categories in the, what we call a blueprint is the parameters that help design all future experiences ever, uh, irrespective, sorry, of what that learning domain or learning stream may be, right? So within that will be what are the critical cost factors you've got to consider. So yes, there's the spend on the vendor or the design and the development. Um, yes, there is, you know, the, those direct costs, but then there's other indirect costs such as um, time off the job, right? The consequence of time off the job. Um, so some of that's easy to get and some of it's not easy to get. Some uh, car, uh, dealership networks back to automotive that we work with track have data that suggests the impact on their business when people and sales people off the showroom floor so then we can take that data and correlate that to the long-term benefit of that in of that so let's say it was you know fifty thousand dollar loss for those two days off we can then track and say okay we've had a greater return against that original fifty thousand so honestly from gp standpoint we're at the mercy of what data that business is able to generate to a certain extent, but it's certainly possible. And my big guidance would be to create a playbook that defines, so no matter who's building that learning, they've at least got the basics of things they want to be factoring in to, to, to determine what those costs are. Whether or not you're able to track those costs or you have data on that, it's from, it's from business to business. Um, I'm conscious of time, Ben, but we have a mm. couple more questions coming through. Would you like to take one more? Well, yeah, let's, I mean, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes longer. So if anyone needs to drop off, that's fine, but I'll continue to take some questions. Right. A question from Audrey. If we are measuring a program for rather senior management leadership with a focus on soft skills, what would you measure besides promotion and ratings? Yeah, well, promotion, What well, again, it comes down to what are you trying to actually achieve, right? So it's hard to say. So that mentor program was for senior leaders. And we did track things like promotions, but we tracked number of X type of conversations that are occurring. Was there an increase in the number of us? Whatever that leadership training was focused on, in that case, it was mentoring, number and frequency of conversations, quality of conversations as rated by the senior leaders and by the people having said conversations. Um, you know, so, so we actually tried to, we actually had to build some metrics that aren't currently measured that would be measured afterwards, right? And we did that through a survey monkey pulses and uh, for another company, we use their internal Qualtrics setup. But uh, I would be looking at what is the skill set or the leadership behavior trying to generate? How does, where does that rubber meet the road? If that's a leadership behavior, if it's strategic communication, if it is, um, you know, more transactional leadership or if it's career development or whatever that, whatever that piece may be, what, where does the rubber meet the road on it? So strategic thinking or strategic communication might be um, some engagement scores around, you know, do people, frequency of strategic communication. Do I feel a sense of ownership and buy-in to the company's vision and strategy? So you might need to create metrics, right? But you want to define them up front, get a buy-in and support that that's what we're going to measure. And then you pulse it out. You create a whole new stream of areas to measure because you may not be measuring it yet. In fact, I'd say, it's most likely that the things that you want to measure, you're not measuring, you need to create them. Hopefully that helps. But yeah, that I would just that rubber meets the road, whatever that skill set is, when that skill set is delivered, what should the impact be? Is it a frequency? Is it a duration? Is it a, a is it a, a volume? Is it a certain sentiment or thought or, or feeling that should happen afterwards? Try to define those things and then measure it accordingly. 
Um, one more question from me. Uh, what are the best ways to measure training effectiveness of uh, change agility management programs, uh, like behavioral slash mindsets or change skills applications? Well, that's a very big question. Um, and the, the, if, I, if I had the measurement mapping slide up, you know, I'd say there is no blanket answer we'd go into, the, the, the real answer is, what are the strategic goals? Why are you doing this? Okay, well, what are the results? You know, I wouldn't just give you a blanket answer up front. I would work with you backwards from the strategic goals because they have different businesses. You know, a startup is in a different position to a global conglomerate that's 100 years old, you know? Um, so, so you'd work backwards, strategic goals, business results, and leading indicators to then determine that. And what I would suggest is that before you say, hey, we want to do change training or resilience training or whatever it may be, you would not get married to that content because maybe once you do that strategic goals, business results, leading indicators process, you might realize, gosh, it's not change management training we needed, or at least not in the way that we thought. That's the big point I'm trying to get across here. If you come at something with content in the center, you'll work towards making sure that content runs. But what we're failing, where training often falls down is we pick that content without truly considering what the business needs and what we want to measure. So put that content to the side, work backwards, and then determine what is the right content to fill that need. You might find that change management isn't the issue. Maybe it's not managers that need the training. Maybe it's, it turns out in the business, it's the individuals that aren't resilient. And we need to train them on how to have a plan and a strategy for dealing with disruption. That's the thing that's needed. You know? And I only figured that out because I did that analysis. So that's really my answer to that question. Then I see that your slide is back up and we are two minutes uh, past the hour. Yeah. So I think um, Zach's showing that. But yeah, if, if yeah. I'm happy to stick around more questions, but you know, we're also happy to wrap up if there's no more questions coming in. There's still a couple more. Um, from YKD, do you recommend to use anecdotal successful learning application stories to supplement quantitative measurement? Yeah, absolutely. People need success stories. I 100% advocate for that, especially when you're doing something new. So we work with a few banks in, in, in the region, um, in APAC, uh, to, as a really good example. And the reason why I'm calling out banks and, and one special automotive manufacturer, because we've been doing some really cutting edge stuff. And to be perfectly honest, when, we go, when we're going through the, the should we go with GP or not phase, the sale phase, and then even in the design phase, once we're selected, there are people in the business who are like, this will never work. Or, or, or it, it works in other companies, but it doesn't work here. You know, there is a resistance to new ways of learning. And sometimes it might be topics, but whenever there's, I think, resistance or, or lack of belief in an approach or, a, or in a design or, or, in some, or in a technology, I would highly recommend building in the ability to capture success stories so people can see that it does work, right? So what we do is, you know, in a program that we run for a few banks, we have it's a spaced social learning experience about leadership so it's spread out over a number of weeks and in the final week it launches week by week there are 200 people moving through it and everyone was like this will never work no one will engage no one will come back no one will participate but it does because we've designed it the right way but what we do is we build in missions into this pro into this activity where one of the missions is hey record a video telling us what are some successes and some failures you've had or you know challenges you've had we have discussions, discussion threads where people get to share things and we get their permission to pull those out and promote those um, to others. So yes, for me, that's a change management question and I highly recommend it. Another question from Nicola. What advice do you have about measuring behavior change in external customers? Behavior change in external customers. Well, look, behavior change is really all about access to said customers, right? Manage, measuring, it so it depends on the design. So on that example that I just gave you, right, of a six-week or a 12-week experience where learners are learning in the flow of their lives, then it's actually easier to measure behavior change. So in that example for the bank, even if that was for external, in fact, we're running a public session for people, for external customers, Later this year for something you guys will be able to, to play around with, right? A six-week experience around career development. We have missions built in there. So the difference is classroom training or, or a one-off event versus a space continuous asynchronous. 
Hi everyone, I think Ben is having a If I've got a one-off event, then that means, and the behavior changes in that event. I can't actually, if I space learning over time where I'm consuming. Oh, I apologize. Can you guys not hear me? Yeah, we lost you for a bit, Ben. I think you're back on. Um, I'm so sorry to, I'm so sorry to everybody. I'm not sure what you heard up to, but, but what I was trying to say, hopefully, is that better Mavis? Yes. Yeah. What I was trying to say is the two big factors, I'll try to summarize it. The two big factors that affect your ability to measure behavior change, whether it's external customers or internal stakeholders, learners, is uh, access to learners, right? So if you have training as an event, it's a one-off thing, and they're practicing in the training room, I might get some basic feedback on their behavior change in the training room. But once they leave and I lose access to them, it's very, very difficult, right? So for that banking example I gave you earlier, what we do is that two-day training now is spread out over 10 weeks. And each week, I might be just learning a small piece of behavior change, growth mindset, um, problem solving, um, uh, conflict handling skills. And what we do is we build in activities and missions where they have to go off and apply something in the flow of their lives and come back and post a video or some comments about how it went, right? So we actually get some data on, um, on actual change outside of the learning, right? So that's kind of number one. If, if you just got it as an event, it's difficult to track that. Number two is obviously pre and post assessments. They're an obvious one, but people often overlook them is running a skills and what I call a confidence survey. For these skills, how confident are you in delivering? How frequently do you use them? You know, and then you, met, you, you run it before the, the course and then you run it six months later or three months later, you can run it multiple times to give you data on behavior change. And, and the best metrics I use is confidence and frequency. Confident are you and how frequently do you use said behaviors and skills? So that can also support um, and even is an, an option if you just got a short burst of training, like two days, you can still use that as well. They're the two main mechanisms we use for behavior change. But ultimately, I want to come back to all I care about is I want behavior change, not for the point of behavior change. I want behavior change because I want that behavior change to lead to results. And so the real indicator of behavior change working is my leading indicators moving. So someone might become a better salesperson or learn sales skills. Their behaviors might change, but who cares? What I really care is if that salesperson is, are the deal, are the, the test drives going up? Are these other indicators going up? So ultimately, behavior change should serve a purpose for the business um, or for their lives, you know? And so that's, that's why those leaning indicators are still relevant for behavior change. Thank you, Ben. Um, given the time, uh, and I do, I do want to thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. I know that we have not been able to address everything, um, and with the um, slight disruption today, please um, drop in your email uh, in the chat if you'd like to have a free consultation with our team, uh, and we will be coming back to you. Now, again, the uh, recording of this session will be uploaded and shared with all of you um, present here today. Uh, thank you so much uh, again, everyone, for making time and hearing um, uh, Ben out today. Uh, do, do sign up for that consultation if you'd like to uh, join us, and we'll be reaching out to you uh, very, very shortly. Yeah, and I apologize about the technical difficulties. We can all blame the Australian government. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I'm conscious of time. Thank you so much again. I'm wishing all of you a very good day ahead. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resource hyphen library.